Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The LIMO Energy Valve, Decreasing Carbon Footprint and Increasing Energy Efficiency, which will be presented by Scott Reed. We really appreciate you joining us today. My name is Ron Pilkowitz, and I will be your moderator. Because we know you will want to watch this webinar again, it will be recorded and posted on Belimo's YouTube site. And we will have a question and answer session at the end of this presentation, and we'd like to hear from you. I invite you at any time to type your questions into the question box, and I will read them aloud during the question and answer session. Scott will answer as many questions as we have time for, but rest assured if we do not get to your question, we will answer it via email afterwards. If you are having any difficulty with today's webinar, simply type me a note in the chat box and I will try to assist you. Before Scott takes over, I'd like to mention that he has a few attachments in today's webinar, so you can download those for your pleasure at any time. And I would now like to turn this presentation right over to Scott. Thank you, Scott. All right, well, thank you, Ron, <clears throat> and welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, taking time out of your day. I hope everyone is uh, doing well. I'm excited today to talk to you about the energy valve and uh, decreasing carbon footprint and increasing energy efficiency. Some topics that are that are very important and are very uh, relatable to Belimo. And uh, today we're going to walk through some of those topics here today. So from an agenda standpoint, uh, some of the topics that we'll cover are the drivers for decreasing carbon footprint and increasing energy efficiency. Some of the uh, national and, and global uh, efforts uh, that, that are underway. Uh, there are a lot of efforts uh, in, in terms of reducing uh, global footprint, which, uh, which is uh, global carbon footprint, which is great. Uh, so we're gonna talk about those and also how they uh, contribute to increasing energy efficiency. We're gonna talk about the opportunities and buildings for energy efficiency and some of the things that go on there and where we could have some opportunity to increase the efficiency within those buildings utilizing uh, the technology that Belimo offers. Uh, gonna be focused primarily today around the energy valve. We'll have a little bit of overview of the energy valve and how it's relatable to this topic today. And as Ron mentioned, uh, Q&A down at the end. So without further ado, let's uh, continue on. So I'd like to start first with some drivers uh, for energy efficiency. So really these are rear drivers combining both decreasing carbon footprint and increasing energy efficiency. And the first one I'd like to talk about is LEED. Uh, LEED uh, is uh, established in 1998. Uh, is, is stands for, for those of you that are not familiar, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design and has a Green Build Certification Program uh, for best-in-class building strategies and practices. Uh, it's recognized uh, around the globe as a, a premier uh, mark of achievement and sustainable green and, uh, and green design and implemented to use uh, design guidelines uh, via a, a LEED scorecard. So there's different categories uh, that they have uh, within LEED that you can uh, achieve points for. Uh, in general, uh, LEED buildings produce 34% less uh, CO2 than, than non-LEED buildings and use 25% uh, less water. Uh, the topic today we're talking about energy valve is uh, actually uh, eligible for LEED points under the energy and atmosphere uh, category. So with uh, credits one and five within there. So I wanted to mention that as well. And one other point, as I mentioned that, the, you know, these topics are very near to Belimo. Uh, our North American uh, headquarters in, in Danbury, Connecticut, and our facility in Sparks, Nevada are both LEED Gold certified. So that's something that we're very proud of. Moving on to some more uh, motivators uh, within this segment, uh, talking about the Department of uh, U.S. Energy and the Department of Defense. Uh, the Department of U.S. Energy really governs a lot of the funding uh, and energy initiatives to, in terms of reducing CO2 emissions and tools provided uh, to help uh, understand uh, what new technologies that can be leveraged. Uh, one of them I'm going to talk about a little bit in the, in the subsequent slides. Um, the uh, federal government is one of the largest uh, property maintainers uh, in the U.S., um, over half a million buildings uh, that they are, uh, that they are uh, maintaining over. And in particular, the Department of Defense has enacted a, um, an initiative to reduce greenhouse gases 80% by 2050 with incremental steps along the way. So it's a pretty significant effort uh, among those that's, that's really being fostered by one of the premier uh, agencies within the world. And of course, ASHRAE. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with ASHRAE. Uh, ASHRAE has really been the beacon uh, in the industry driving energy efficiency uh, as far back as, let's say, the uh, standard uh, 90.1 standard, a benchmark for commercial energy codes. 
Uh, this here is, a, is, is really a standard that provides minimum requirements for energy uh, efficiency uh, and design for, for most commercial uh, buildings. And that's one of the things that the, the energy valve has a, a particular component with as well. There's a, a piece within there called critical zone reset uh, that, uh, that the energy valve is uh, able to leverage within this uh, strategy. And I want to say here that there's a lot of these um, uh, drivers that, uh, that are available. But in terms of, uh, of time of this webinar, I'm going to keep it somewhat consolidated to the major ones that we're going to be seeing today. Uh, another pro program via ASHRAE is their, uh, called their ASHRAE Vision, which is uh, around um, providing uh, tools and resources to enable marketable uh, net zero uh, buildings uh, coming up by the target of 2030. Um, so that's another interesting piece there as well. But one of the other nice driving pieces about the ASHRAE is they're, is they're kind of enveloped into these other agencies. So the Department of Energy uh, and that initiative that I spoke about earlier to reduce the greenhouse gases is implementing the ASHRAE 90.1 standard within that. So there, there's some crossover between these agencies, which is, which is really good because it helps move along the initiatives. Efficiency Canada, <clears throat> uh, as, as early as uh, last month, uh, the Canadian government, mainly the Canadian Min Minister of Natural Resources, uh, announced that uh, Canada will be entering what's called the 3% Club, which is a collaboration of government supporting organizations that will work to commit uh, reducing 3% uh, uh, annual energy consumption uh, as, a, as a kind of co coalition among these different countries. Uh, there is a task force that's been uh, assigned to this, and they recommended $27.3 billion of retrofits uh, starting uh, to uh, happen very uh, uh, soon within Canada. And it's part of an overall uh, strategy to kind of recover from COVID-19 and it really enable their workforce to really uh, be a more energy efficient uh, faction, if you will. It said that it takes, it's going to, uh, Canada will need to triple their energy efficiency efforts to meet this standard. So it's a pretty, another significant undertaking. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, uh, you know, the, these are kind of a little more uh, overreaching. There are some more local ones going on, and I'm going to talk about these three here. Uh, the first one is uh, New York City's uh, roadmap. Uh, which they call the 80 by 50, which is similar to what the, the Department of uh, Energy is doing, where they want to reduce their greenhouse gases 80% by the year 2050 and 40% by 2030. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, aggressive uh, target that they had. And within this, they also want to scale up uh, energy retrofits and holistically address the heating and cooling systems. So there's all the opportunity for us within the HVAC space. Um, this is going to be a, uh, a program where the buildings are compared to a baseline, and that baseline is going to be then graded by, by a letter grade, and that letter grade is going to be posted on all the buildings. Uh, and then if they are not meeting the energy efficiency uh, standards and, and guidelines that have been proposed to them, there are actually going to be significant fines that are going to be imposed upon them. Uh, California is also uh, having uh, some, some of their own initiatives themselves. They've already been uh, pretty deep uh, in energy uh, initiatives, uh, going as far back as, uh, as um, uh, Title 24. Uh, so they also have set a, a very aggressive target to uh, reduce their, uh, similar to New York, the greenhouse gas is 80% by 2050, and then almost 40% by the year 2030. So it's another very very uh, aggressive goal, and they want to double the rate of energy efficiency savings within their buildings. And Chicago is a similar uh, program as well. As I mentioned, there's a lot of initiatives in, in, uh, around, around reducing carbon uh, footprint and increasing energy efficiency. Uh, over 325 uh, U.S. cities have committed uh, to this, uh, but in interest of time today, uh, I'm just going to kind of, like I said, level it to some of the, some of the higher level ones. So let's talk about why this is so important. Um, buildings are an integral part of the energy system within our, within our space. And uh, in terms of carbon emissions, uh, if we look at carbon emissions output by industry, 25% of the, of the output of carbon emissions is directly related to energy. And buildings use a lot of energy, which you're gonna see coming up shortly. So there's other industries that, uh, that contribute to that. The next largest uh, is, is, is industry itself and then followed by transportation, and they start to kind of slide off a little bit after that. But energy is really a, one, of, a, one of the biggest producers of, of, of the carbon footprint of what we're looking at today, 
and, and the buildings are kind of a uh, go hand in hand with uh, with that step as well. Uh, talk about building consumption and production. So in terms of total energy, uh, buildings use 40% of uh, of the total energy. Um, they use uh, 40 and uh, as equal as well, 40% of that total energy that they use is consumed by the HVAC system. They produce 39% of the CO2 emissions, 36% of the greenhouse gases, and, and you consume 25% of the water. So as you're gonna see coming up a little bit, how the energy valve is gonna really good fit to helping reduce uh, those CO2 emissions, uh, level some of that energy usage, and improve some of the water usage. One of the other drivers uh, kind of at the building level is the cost per energy uh, is, is, is continuing to increase. Um, you can see over a few year period here that this is a national average for uh, for KWH across the US. And we see we're at about 11.89 cents, so almost 12 cents. <clears throat> In my region, uh, we just received uh, our, our, our bills uh, and the KWH didn't really increase all that much, but the service charge did, double digits. And that's gonna be rippling back through through um, through other residents as well and other, other commercial buildings. So this is one of the more of the reasons why we need to be cognizant of the energy usage. As we talked about before, with Belimo being a um, uh, ha having lead uh, achievement for, for our, our buildings, uh, we are committed to sustainability. And this here is just a little bit more of an example of that. It shows a, a description of how our field devices contribute to the impact of, of CO2 uh, within those devices and really how we, how we are very efficient within our devices. So what we what we have is a model where we look at the contribution uh, over over kind of six steps, if you will, uh, the total resources, the manufacturing, the distribution, the operation, the energy savings, and then the recycling, and we look at how much that that's going to contribute, and we kind of aggregate that over our valve and actuator line and our and our actuators by itself, and we see that we come out with a a total of about 47.2 kilograms uh, of total contribution. And then we apply a European uh, standard, uh, which is used to uh, look at performance data, actually EN15232-2017, which calculates kind of impacts of the savings that, that our devices um, have. And we see <clears throat> that we have a very large uh, impact on those. So one point, almost 1.103 kilograms uh, of savings versus our total output of around 47.2 kilograms. So we have 24 times the savings uh, utilizing our devices versus our input to the total CO2. So that's very, very powerful. And that's something we're very proud of. Uh, so if we look at that in terms of pieces, we see for 7.2 million pieces that were produced last year uh, for valves and actuator combinations, that would result to 7.6 ton, 7 .6 million tons of CO2 emissions prevented by, by our devices. So then that's very, very powerful. And again, that's a, a weighted average utilizing uh, the, the two product categories, if you will, uh, segregated together. Some of the products uh, where we see that contr contribution coming from, uh, of course, is the energy valve. And we're gonna talk about how that, achieve, how that happens today. Uh, our zone type product range, where we uh, utilize some of the lowest uh, power consumption for our actuators, uh, so 0 0.3, 0 0.3 watts. And for our, um, advanced butterfly valve where we have 80% uh, less energy consumption compared to other models. So that's kind of the, the drivers uh, that I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, reducing carbon footprint and increasing energy efficiency. Now let's talk about where we also have some opportunities for uh, and, and buildings to, to achieve uh, some energy efficiency and, and some of the things that reasons why we, we can obtain that. The first one I'd like to talk about is uh, is around energy modeling, uh, and this is around the eQuest uh, uh, modeling software. eQuest modeling software is actually uh, a product of the uh, Department of Energy, which I was talking about uh, earlier. I said they do provide a lot of tools and, and resources uh, in this space. And the thing I'd like to talk about is some of the some of the assumptions that these this modeling softwares make. Um, you know, eQuest is, is, like I said, by the Department of Energy, but other private uh, modeling softwares, uh, they do kind of make some of the same assumptions, so it does kind of carry through. So the first one is that there's proper valve sizing. Uh, valves are properly, properly sized for, from, uh, from, from the get-go. 
Um, I would estimate that somewhere north of 80% of valves and, and coils there and other equipment within the HVA system is, is oversized. And in a little bit, we're gonna talk about why that is. Stable system pressures. Uh, these modeling softwares are, are somewhat uh, static in, in terms of uh, assigning pressures. They will assign a, a, uh, a, a pressure drop to a valve and assume that uh, that valve is gonna behave, for assuming that it's seeming, seeing a stable system pressure. Uh, but with, as what we're gonna see coming up, that, that that stable system pressure is not always something that uh, is really realized in a, an actual operating building model. And the valves have perfect valve authority. And what we're talking about here is really that um, all valves are gonna behave the same way uh, at, with a changing uh, system pressures. So all of these here are assumptions that mm, probably not the best assumptions to, to make, but then that carried off into the actual operation of the building. So let's kind of take a look at the first one at the uh, proper valve sizing. So in terms of hydronic uh, valve sizing, we're looking at sizing pressure dependent valves. And it, it's fairly simple. Um, you, if you size, uh, size the valve, you've probably seen this uh, formula here. It's the C sub V or the flow coefficient, which means you take the square root of the delta P divided by the GPM. So if we were to do a little exercise here, uh, we would see our spec uh, calls for a coil, uh, which requires 250 GPM of design GPM. Um, and that's a fairly large uh, air handling coil. Uh, the spec probably leads uh, no more than uh, five uh, PSI. So we're just gonna use four PSI because it kind of simplifies the math. So if we do our flow coefficient, we take our 250, take the square root of the delta P and we get a, a C sub V or flow coefficient of 125. So now this pressure dependent valve needs to be sized or selected actually. So they go to the manufacturer catalog. And for this example, we'll take a slice out of the Belimo catalog, but multiple manufacturers catalogs would be very, very similar. So we saw that we need a C sub V of 125. And we go to our catalog and we see we have a three inch valve and a four inch valve. And neither one have the exact 125 uh, CV that we're looking for. So uh, inherently, uh, we're probably going to select uh, the, uh, the larger size valve because we don't want to undersize the system. And if we were to do a further calculation looking at the, looking at the Delta P, we would actually realize that the, the, the 90 CV would, uh, would not be a, a proper fit anyway. So we're going to select an oversized valve right out of the gate. Now this happens with valves and this also happens with coils uh, as well. When a design engineer makes their, uh, makes their load uh, calculation, uh, and they come out with a particular load calculation for a coil and that coil is then going to the coil catalog, that exact coil is not uh, available. And once again, it's upsized. So, so valves, coils and equipment are inherently oversized uh, right out of the gate. So when we talk about pressure independent valves, we have, uh, we have a nice little benefit here because we don't really need to take into consideration the, the flow coefficient. Uh, all we need to understand is that we're meeting the Delta P now, all we need to match ourselves to is, is the design GPM. So once again, with that same requirement, we see we have design GPM of uh, 250 and a delta P of four. So we don't really concern ourselves too much with the delta P as long as the delta P range of that pressure independent valve was within that spec. So we need really end up saying, all we really need to concentrate on is a GPM itself. And the nice thing about pressure independent valves is in our catalog, we can select the exact flow that you need programmed from the factory. So in this case here, this is once again, a slice from the Belimo catalog. And we see that if we have a flow code that we could select and come up with an exact GPM of 250. So that's gonna arrive on site, uh, pre-programmed to the exact GPM that is needed, not oversized uh, and not gonna be at mercy to pressure fluctuations within the system. These can also be configured uh, on site as well as usage and load patterns change. Uh, we have multiple ways that we can configure our pressure, uh, pressure independent valves. So it makes them very flexible uh, within the field. So what do, what do these oversized control valves do within the system? Uh, this is a fairly simple uh, diagram here, uh, just you know, kind of a couple, a couple of branches, if you will. Uh, looking at a, a static balancing uh, system. So we have a, a coil and kind of closer to the pump and a coil a little bit farther away from the pump, just kind of simplifying uh, the diagram, if you will, and some static balancing valves. 
And one of the issues with the static balancing valves is they're balanced at a single low condition, a full flow condition. So that uh, as system pressures change within the system, those pressure drops across the across the control valves and balancing valves are going to change, and some are going to be, begin to have a little less controllability and result overflowing uh, of the coil. So the, var, the valves that are far from the pump, uh, for example, on the, on the upper uh, section here, gonna have some minor controllability issues. Uh, they'll be able to react a, a little bit better, but still no protection from pressure changes. So as pressures change throughout there, they're gonna be constantly uh, hunting around, trying to find uh, the, that, that best uh, controllability and hence overflowing the coil. Now the valves near the pump are actually gonna have major controllability issues, um, considerably overflowing. And once again, no protection from pressure changes. And that is one of the benefits of utilizing pressure independent valves is because they do that constant balancing or what we call dynamic balancing. So the valve is always gonna be operating at the exact GPM required for that coil. So one of the other drivers uh, that's really impacting, uh, you know, opportunity in, in buildings for today is the impact of, of COVID-19. And I'm gonna break it down in a couple of different scenarios. Um, the first of which is uh, the HVAC system could be utilized uh, more than it has typically been, uh, with more concerns about uh, indoor air quality, in particular humidity. Um, HVAC systems could be running 24-7, uh, uh, whereas opposed to prior to, prior to the pandemic, um, you know, there could be some setbacks in the evening and the HVAC systems were kind of scaled back and, 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 and shut down. Now, some of those problems that I was talking about earlier with the pressure dependent valves are gonna be that that situation is gonna occur even longer and that energy waste from, from those valves overflowing or what you're gonna see in a little bit is gonna be even worse. There's also another situation uh, as well as, as these, some of these uh, buildings are at uh, partial capacity or 20 to 30% capacity. That's gonna be shutting down, uh, shutting down zones uh, within the building possibly. And uh, what that's gonna do is once again, have influence on those system pressures throughout the building, once again, causing a lot of those pressure dependent valves uh, to overflow. So what is really the result of these, uh, of these actions here? So we have some modeling assumptions or, or emissions uh, that, that, we're, that we put into place uh, that really cause some, some oversized valves and coils. We have static balancing. So all of these kind of all of these kind of result into uh, uh, low delta T syndrome. So overflowing our, our coils uh, and inefficient heat transfer. So we're not we're not utilizing uh, the heat transfer because we're passing water through those coils too quickly. And in essence, we're also wasting energy and contributing thing to a larger uh, carbon footprint. So let's talk a little bit now about the energy valve as it comes in as a, a potential solution for this here. So it'd break down a little bit of Belimo energy valve overview. So first, uh, the, well, I'd like to talk about Delta T Manager. Now, there is an al algorithm built into, uh, into the energy valve, uh, is what we call a performance device, where we integrate logic to understand uh, what, that, what the Delta T is across that coil, so we don't go into a low Delta T syndrome situation. Have two temperature sensors that allow us to understand what the coil Delta T is, and know when it starts to move away from design, and we have an uh, algorithm when, within our valve that is going to mitigate that delta T syndrome. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. We have monitoring, uh, real-time monitoring. I'm going to talk about some of those features that we have there in terms of monitoring. Cloud services, going to break those down for you as well. At its core, it is a pressure independent control valve, so it performs that hydron hydronic balancing or that dynamic balancing, and is also, once again, a shutoff valve as well. So let's talk about coil power versus delta T behavior. So here we have uh, we have flow on GPM on the bottom. On the left axis, we have power. And on the right, we have delta T. So within this, we see that flow and delta T are inversely proportional. And if we look at the, the formula to calculate power, we see that it's 500 times GPM times delta T. So an influence in a delta T is gonna have an effect over, over the GPM requirement. And, and, and consequently, over the power output. And what we can start to understand with the energy valve, with that, with that uh, logic in there, is where the coil starts to saturate because we're continuously monitoring the delta T. So we can understand what we call the power saturation point. And that power saturation point, what we call past that is what's called the waste zone. 
So as you can start to see that coil power characteristic is starting to flatten out, and we're starting to get decreased uh, uh, power output out of this coil. So essentially what we're doing is over pumping water through that coil without getting commensurate uh, BTUs within there. So as I said, operating on the waste zone, we're pumping more water, we're reducing our delta T, and we're getting a marginal increase in our BTUs. All three things we don't really want to have occur. So what we have is taking a little bit closer look at that and looking, looking at the data. This is a, a section from a, a valve that we had installed in the field. And this here, once again, is looking at the, the, the power curve of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, particular valve in operation, but it's really looking at all the data points. All those square oranges are data points. And I'll focus on a couple of data points within this here. The first one is around uh, 20 GPM, and we see we have uh, about 130 kilobtus. And then we look at the second point here, the second large cluster, which is 50 GPM, and we got about 130 or so um, uh, kilobtus. And what we realized by looking at this is that we could really operate somewhere in between that, uh, because the difference between uh, 20 GPM to 50, 50 GPM is marginal, about a 10% uh, increase but we see there's a lot of opportunity here that we could operate within this, this wide coil band to really leverage that, uh, that coil characteristic. And that's one of the benefits of what the energy valve does. It recognizes that to really optimize the sweet, point, sweet spot of that coil. So let's talk about a little bit about the Delta T manager operation. So this here is that first uh, slide that I've shown you of the coil characteristic and the, and the Delta T characteristic. And we see here that we have a design delta T of 12 degrees. And we start to see out here, we're already in the waste zone. We're past the power saturation point, and we're starting to overflow this coil. So what we wanna do is modulate this coil to bring our flow point back to right here where we're below the power saturation point at around 55 GPM, and really leverage that wide power band within the coil. So let's talk about a little of the benefits of the delta T manager. This here is, a, is a, an example of what's uh, the valve operating in, in different control modes or a, a, a operating scenario of valves in different control modes. So the first one would be a conventional control. We see we have a uh, delta T's of around the six degree range showing about 240 GPM. Pressure independent mode where we have uh, a little bit higher delta T's and we've reduced some of our uh, the operating GPM because we now have less fluctuation within system pressure. But with Delta T management, we have an even better improvement because we're able to really hone in on that Delta T strategy. And if we look at this over a single load period here, we see over a 60 ton load period that we see we have used two and a half times more water as a conventional control valve due to pressure fluctuations within the system and inability to really control those as we would to uh, uh, compare to an energy valve with a Delta T management functionality. So that's two and a half times more water or essentially two and a half more times more dollars that we've taken uh, to control this. This also affects the plant as well. Uh, you know, and the, the plants are really gonna be responding to what's happening at the coils. So we really wanna address it at the coil first and it's gonna kind of take care of the plant here as well. And I'm gonna show you how that's gonna happen. So the first one here I'm talking about is uh, plant is more efficient at design than at low delta T. So at low delta T is gonna ca cause increased flow, which is gonna be a higher volumetric uh, uh, requirement and that could possibly in include additional chillers coming on. And let's talk about why that happens. So if we look at this uh, situation here, we have two chillers, we have a 500 tons and we see uh, with our 500 tons times 24 divided by the delta T of our standard GPM calcula calculation, we see that we need a, a 1,000 GPM to, to maintain that, that loop. But what happens when that delta T depresses? It's going to affect uh, the G overall GPM requirement. So if we went from a 12 degree, which was our previous design that we we're looking at before, to an 8 degree, we now see we've uh, exceeded that GPM requirement. We have to kick on another chiller. And another chiller means additional cooling fans, cooling towers, and more, more energy that's really being used that is not really needed because we could probably could have served that load with the one chiller. 
One of the case studies that I'd love to talk to you about here is our Citizens Plaza. Uh, this case study here is one of the attachments. Um, so I, I would welcome you to, uh, to download that and take a look at that for your, for your later viewing. Uh, and this was one of, one of, our, um, one of our premier uh, case studies. It was uh, the Citizens Plaza building in downtown Nashville. It's a class A office building, 275,000 square feet and 15 stories. Uh, and what we found with this building is that uh, uh, there was a lot of oversized valves and coils or oversized glow valves and oversized uh, coils within there, which made it a perfect uh, solution for, for the energy valve. We saw initially Delta T's from the four to eight degree range. After installing the energy valves, we were able to improve that to 10 to the 14 degree range and were resulting in a yearly savings of $23,000, which was primarily coming from the service charges that they were receiving by receiving their, the, their chilled water from their distribution plant. We reduced that water from the distribution plant by 49%, which is, which is significant, and it was a huge success for us. So I welcome you to take a, a little bit uh, deeper look into this um, case study, because uh, there's a lot of beneficial information in there. If you look on our website, there's also a, um, a video uh, for this uh, case study as well, which also is really well done. Okay, one of the tools that we additionally offer uh, with the energy valve is uh, the savings estimator. So you may want to understand uh, what, what you could see in terms of savings before installing an energy valve. And this will allow you to calculate exactly that. You can put in your annual, uh, you can put in your energy cost, uh, the configuration about your, your, your chilled water plant, your number of chillers, your chiller efficiency, your overall project cost, and it's gonna give you an output of saying, okay, if I were to go from a six degree Delta T to a 12 degree Delta T, this would be my savings and flow. This would be my pumping cost savings, chiller cost savings, total cost savings, and also my energy savings in KWH. It will aggregate that financial analysis over a five year period. And it will also show you the amount of carbon dioxide, uh, CO2 emissions avoided and greenhouse gases avoided. So it's one thing you can use as a, as a way to kind of get that out in front to understand what the potential savings could be by eliminating that overflow. So let's move on to a couple more features that we talked about a little bit earlier, the monitoring and the cloud services. So monitoring, we have an onboard uh, interface that uh, you can connect directly to the energy valve. And it allows you to understand in terms of what the actual flow is and, and live flow with the valve position. If you're supplying return water temperature, you to understand what I was uh, operating in terms of seeing its set point, what, what, the, what mode it's in. If there's any errors uh, with the valve, it allows you to uh, see that here uh, as well. So it's one more way to really understand that the power of the data that the energy valve captures. All of this data that you're seeing here can be also exported uh, out, of the, uh, out of the energy valve and a CSV file for, for further analysis. Also incorporated in here is uh, the power characteristic that we're looking at earlier. So uh, for in particular, if you didn't know the, the best uh, Delta T set point to operate your coil, you could install an energy valve, run it for a while, and it will actually calculate the best Delta T set point for you to implement. So very powerful uh, tools that are integrated all uh, with no additional software or updates to install within the energy valve. There's also key performance indicators uh, built directly into it uh, that show, for example, what, uh, how, how the valve is operating either total or monthly. So what control mode it's in, how often the Delta T manager has been enacted, uh, what the flow is like in terms of what the maximum flows, minimum flows and average flows. Same thing with power and delta temperature, what the total cooling energy is, the total heating energy, or the total flow being used. So it really allows you to understand from an operational standpoint, you know, how the valve is operating, looking at these key performance indicators, allowing you to really monitor what's going on with the operation of the valve. Now I'd like to talk about the cloud services. Uh, our cloud services are, uh, are integrated directly uh, with our product. Um, and we have uh, six cloud services that I'd like to talk to you about. The first one is optimization of Delta T and flow settings. Uh, this will allow uh, a recommendation to be pushed directly to the valve or reviewed first of what the best Delta T set can be. Really allowing to uh, understand the best operating set point and really achieve that automatically through our cloud. Receive a, a quarterly performance report that shows how the valve has been operating in terms of 
uh, how much energy it saved year over year and quarter over quarter. If there's any issues with the valve, we have the ability for online support. We can connect directly to your valves. It really gives a more robust uh, online support experience as opposed to calling into our technical support with possibly a screenshot or whatever. We have software updates that can be uh, automatically loaded uh, into the valve. So those can be uh, directly loaded, particularly a lot of um, uh, valves within the building. You know, these valves are difficult to, to get to sometimes. They're up in the ceilings, uh, outside, uh, on, on the roof, on uh, the basement. Um, so it really helps to a product running in terms of uh, product if there are any quality issues. We extend the warranty for another year, and we also have lifetime data access. On board with the elevator, we store 13 months worth of trend of data, but through the cloud, you have lifetime access accessibility. One of the last uh, features I'd like to talk about Valve is uh, our uh, what we call Wilimo Clear Edge, which is an on form for valve optimization. Uh, within that we have some features that I'd like to talk to you about. The Blimo Clear Edge is the orange device down uh, and down the center right of the screen. The first one is automatic discovery. Automatic discovery allows you to automatically uh, map this product and load it within to uh, your system. This product integrates directly with a BACnet network, so either BACnet MSTP and IP. So to perform discovery within within those networks to pull the data directly into the clear edge uh, device. It's starting, uh, what the valve has been using, how much energy the valve has been using. Uh, it should get a really tight synopsis the how the valve is operating. The curves, the curves that were uh, earlier, uh, also has the ability to extrapolate these here as well. It also has the energy savings calculator. What it does is performs a baseline uh, operation when it's first installed. And it looks at that operation versus baseline and tries to um, extrapolate what the automatic, what the, what the energy savings calculator calculation can be. There's also a massive set point uh, configuration. And what this does is allows you to change multiple set points uh, across the valve with a single, with a single operation. So for example, if you want to say, change all the uh, flow set points for the valves, for example, it allows you to do this in a mass configuration instead of having to go to every individual valve. Same thing with setting like Delta T. Uh, you're going to have different, different Delta T settings from the winter uh, to the summer, uh, and this will allow you to do that in a, in a mass change. And there's also a really cool feature of the automatic and continuous Delta T optimization. And what this does is uh, it, it runs a routine looking at the data to try to automatically optimize the delta T uh, operation within the valve. So it's always gonna be continuously looking at the best delta T set point, and it's automatically gonna load that into the valve to really optimize the valve automatically. So it kind of takes uh, that, that effort away of trying to understand, analyzing the data, looking at, or possibly connecting through the cloud. It really allows you to look at um, what the best operating set point is from, from a really automated standpoint. So this brings me to my conclusion slide here. Um, I know there's a lot of information in a short period of uh, time. Uh, we see that uh, you know our buildings are using a lot of a uh, lot of energy, contributing a lot to the carbon footprint. We see that there is a some nice drivers uh, within our industry and and locally uh, that are helping to uh, reduce some of that. And I hope I showed you today that we have some products in the energy valve and other products that can help uh, help contribute uh, to that uh, to that reduction. So at this time, I'd like to thank you for your, for your time and your attention, and I'd like to turn it over to any questions and answers that you might have. Well, thank questions you very much. Have. Thank you very much, Scott. I do apologize for going over just a little bit. And before we go on to one or two questions, I just wanted to say, please follow Belimo on social media. And I will ask just a couple of questions, Scott, since we are over. The first question is, is the energy valve eligible for, L for lead points? Yes, it is. Uh, under the energy and uh, atmosphere uh, credit uh, through sections one, uh, one and five. Thank you much. I'll take one more. How many energy valves were installed at Citizens Plaza, Tennessee State Building? Yeah, that's another good question. Uh, there was a total of 15 uh, energy valves installed there. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up for today. I want to thank you again for attending today's webinar. And Scott, thank you for presenting.
Remember, if you do have any additional questions after today's webinar, you can email training at us.belimo.com. And remember, this will be, the webinar will be posted on Belimo's YouTube site. And please join us for our next webinar on September 16th for a discussion on reopening facilities and maintaining proper IAQ levels to minimize airborne virus exposure. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.